What is going on, everybody? Welcome back to my YouTube channel, Richard on Data. And if this is your first time here, my name is Richard, and this is the channel where we talk about all things data, data science, statistics, and programming. So subscribe for all kinds of content just like this if you haven't already, and hit the notification bell so YouTube notifies you whenever I upload a video. So this is going to be a very special edition in my R tutorial series. We're going to kick off a new series in here all about the caret package. Now for those of you totally unfamiliar with what that is, caret stands for classification and regression ensemble training. This package was developed by RStudio and former Pfizer data scientist Max Kuhn. And the idea is, the problem used to be, you had all these disparate packages for, you'd have one for pre-processing, one for uh, each method that you want to use, one for summarizing the results. It was just too disconnected and all over the place. And the idea with Carrot is, it's a one-stop shop for all of your machine learning needs. Now the reason I'm making a whole series out of this rather than just one tutorial is because this package is absolutely massive. There's way too much that I could possibly cover in one simple tutorial, but throughout the series we're going to cover generally prepping your data set up for machine learning purposes, visualizing the feature distribution by class because we're tackling classification rather than regression here, uh, pre-processing the data set, I'm going to show you how to remove low information features algorithmically if you choose to do that, uh, visualizing feature importance, the various definitions of metrics of performance, so things like sensitivity, specificity, and positive predictive value, things that generally tell us how well uh, our classifier is doing, uh, hyperparameter tuning, using non-standard sampling methods like down or up sampling to correct for class imbalance issues, altering our boundaries for classifier thresholds, and then lastly, training and resampling multiple models. So before we get started here, just a few uh, links to point out here, uh, just general places where this tutorial series draws some influence. Uh, number one, the GitHub documentation from Max Kuhn is absolutely phenomenal. It's a very comprehensive uh, documentation. Uh, so highly recommend getting getting yourself acquainted with that. Uh, I'm going to provide a link here to this absolutely wonderful tutorial from uh, author Selva Prabhakaran. So I got a lot of the idea for the structure for this tutorial actually from this one. Um, the first time I ever went through this tutorial, must have been a couple years now, but I learned a lot from it. Um, now I'm working with a totally different sort of problem here as well as just adding a few different things in and outside of the carrot package uh, But a lot of the influence and the overall structure. I got the idea from this tutorial. So Huge amount of credit goes out to uh, goes out to this tutorial definitely recommend checking that out And then lastly, there's a tutorial I'm going to provide here also on uh, just how you deal with some of these class imbalance type of problems so just a few more things before we get started. Number one, smash the like button for the YouTube algorithm. I'll have a link in the description to my Patreon account. If you guys would be willing to support me over there, that would be awesome. And then this script will be provided on my GitHub repo, also in the description of the video. So for this tutorial series, we're going to make use of the German credits data set. Now I really like this data set for a tutorial basis because it really illustrates some of the real life problems that you're gonna run into whenever you deal with machine learning problems. So we have one response variable here. It's a categorical variable class with two values, good or bad, referring to whether the subject in question is a good or a bad credit risk. And it's a little bit imbalanced in the sense that good is going to show up 70% of the time and bad is going to show up 30% of the time. And so actually in the real world, that's not necessarily that bad. Like I personally am used to dealing with 90 to 10 imbalances or even 95 to five. So when I see 70 to 30, I'm honestly a little bit relieved by that. But regardless, we're going to see some of the challenges that that can cause throughout this tutorial. Now, I, this, this data set has a lot of variables to it, and I'm not even gonna bring every single one of them in, but most of these variables are categorical. So I'm gonna bring them in, and now this isn't actually a feature of this data set, but I'm going to do it here. Uh, I'm actually for 3% of the age variable, 
and for 70 and for no excuse me seven percent of the employment duration variable i'm just going to make these missing missing data is a fact of life that you are going to have to deal with with real world machine learning problems and i want to show you later here how we're going to deal with missing data so all I'm going to do is randomly sample through some of the rows for the age variable, some of the rows for uh, the employment duration variable, and then I'm just going to make those values uh, into NAs. So just, just, just simulate some missing data here. Then just as a last step here, uh, we're actually going to turn everything back to numerics at the very end. But some of these variables I'm just going to make into factors. So it's always a good step in any machine learning problem just to get a summary of your data set, get a feel for what we're working with here. And what we're going to see here is, for one thing, this class variable here, again, this is the 70 to 30% uh, response variable I was talking about. And you wanna look for some of these uh, variables that don't have a ton of variation to them or have some levels that occur very infrequently like for instance this number of existing credits a variable is a red flag to me and now we're going to deal with some of these problems algorithmically but it's always a good idea up front just explore your data set a little bit and get an idea of what you're working with now one of the weird things to point out about this data set here is that these factor variables are not all coded in the same way so take, for instance, the variables telephone and foreign worker. Now, these were just coded as zeros and ones. Telephone, it's either zero or one. Likewise for foreign worker. But then we have these variables housing.rent, housing.own, and housing.forfree. So rent, own, and for free are obviously different values of one variable that's housing. And you can verify this yourself, like if you look at all the rows, either housing rent, housing own, or housing for free are going to be a one. But these are just different ways of encoding these factor variables. And so it helps to have these things in a consistent format, and we're going to do that later. But first, just in the spirit of continuing with our exploration of the data set here, uh, we're going to make use of this wonderful feature plot a function. So for the feature plot, we need to pass in something to x, something to y, and then optionally something for plot here. Now if you look at the documentation here, uh, for the x we need a data frame, uh, for y we need our response variable, and for plot you can select for classification purposes, box or strip or density, pairs or ellipse. Let's see a couple different examples here. So starting with box plots, we can just see what the distribution of employment duration looks like for the bad and for the good uh, credit uh, classes. Maybe a tiny little bit of difference there. For age, it's not as clear. Uh, alternatively, we can do a density plot instead. Uh, now I'm going to do this for the same two types of variables. Uh, you can see the different uh, density plots here. Now, um, again, maybe a little bit of difference for employment duration. Uh, sometimes for different types of visualizations, you can see things for one that you can't in the other. Uh, but now, actually, let's take a look for uh, the property variable, which, again, this is coded in, well, really four different columns here. And we see, actually, for this unknown uh, level here, that's where the two classes look probably the most different, whereas for the, for the others, not really so much. Now another super helpful function from the caret package is this near zero ver function. Obviously that stands for near zero variance. And as always, the help documentation is your friend. It breaks down exactly how the function works. What we're going to do is we're going to return the indexes of predictors that either have one single unique value, that is they literally have zero variance, or predictors that have two uh, characteristics. Namely, they have very few unique values relative to the number of samples and the ratio of the frequency of the most common value to the frequency of the second most common value is large. So there's going to be two key arguments that we want to pass here. That's frequency cut and unique cut. Frequency cut is the cutoff for the ratio of the most common value to the second most common value. 
and unique cut is the cutoff for the percentage of distinct values out of the number of total samples, that is rows or observations. Now, this is not a perfect function and you're gonna see why here. Uh, the default uh, uh, arguments here are frequency cut are 95 over five and unique cut is 10. Now, I took a more extreme case here and it returned more uh, variables here. Uh, but there are definitely some limitations here. Now, in the more extreme case, there are more variables that get returned, uh, but a number of these are actually values of the housing and property variables. Remember from before, actually these were coded where a level had its own column. So when your data set is set up like that, you're gonna get some weird results as you see here. And actually that variable I pointed out before, number existing credits, uh, just to show you that from, uh, from before, it's this variable here where it's a little truncated in the window here, but uh, where the level four only appears six times, that does not get returned by the near zero variance function here. So again, this function, it's useful, but it has limitations. So don't totally rely on it. What I'm going to do here just for handling my lack of variance in some variables is I'm going to take the recommendation from uh, the near zero variance function. Uh, in both times it was complaining about the foreign worker variable for lack of variance. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this uh, factor collapse function uh, that's from the forecast package uh, to condense levels two, three, and four into a level two plus. Okay, now the next thing that we're going to do in this machine learning pipeline is we're going to partition the data into a training set and into a test set. Now to do this, we're going to use this wonderful create data partition function from, uh, from Carrot. And now why this is so helpful compared to just using the sample function is this function is going to allow us to partition based on the proportion from the response variable. Meaning, remember how we have that 70-30 split in our response variable, 70% uh, is the good class and 30% is the bad class. Well, when we use this function, this is going to allow us to retain those proportions. So in both the training and the test sets, we're still going to have that 70-30 split. Now, what I'm going to do here is I'm gonna want 70% of the data to be the training set and 30% to be the test set. Now, you always need a good, healthy amount of data in order to train the model, but you need enough in order to provide uh, some kind of testing set so that we know how well our classifier performs. So a good rule of thumb here is about 30%, maybe 33% for the testing set. I've seen typically anywhere from 20% to, on the high end, 40%. Uh, but 70-30, once again, is a pretty good split. So when we use the create data partition function, it's going to return uh, the row indices. So it's super easy just to uh, subset based on rows for our initial data set to create the training set. Just stick a minus right at the beginning of our subset to create the test set, and then we're good to go. We've got two data sets. So just to do a final diagnostic here, we can run a summary for the training set just to check for uh, red flags. Uh, you can see right up front that the class variable did, in fact, retain that 70-30 split. And now, as far as the amount variable is concerned here, it's important to point out that you do have some outliers here, but we can handle that in our pre-processing pipeline. I don't really uh, see a whole lot of other red flags here, so we're ready to go for other pre-processing steps. All right, now the last thing that I'm going to leave you with in this video is this pre-process function. And this is where we really start to get into the meat and potatoes of machine learning. Because once again, before we can even think about training uh, models, we need to make sure that our data are processed and we have a really good solid format for both our training set and for our test set. Now there's multiple transformations that we wanna to make to both of these. Specifically, we have missing values and we need to impute those missing values. We don't have a consistent format for our factor variables or for our dummy variables, and we wanna have a consistent format. So one hot encoding or what you saw for the property and for the housing variables where you had a different column for each of the, le of the levels. 
And then lastly, we want to normalize all the variables. So the range from them goes between zero and one. So we're going to do all of that just by using this uh, preprocess function as well as also the dummy vars function, uh, which works in a very similar way. So the key argument to the preprocess function is this method argument. You'll see that the default is center and scale, that is just converting variables into z scores. But if you look at the argument uh, description here, you'll see possible values for the method argument include things like KNN impute or bag impute or median impute. This is how we're going to impute missing data. So these are just different algorithmic approaches that we could take for missing data imputation. Uh, I'm just going to use uh, the bagging approach, that is the bag impute method. And now what we're going to do is if we just create this bag missing object by running the preprocess function, it takes in t the training set and our method is bag impute. It's just going to return the model. What we need to do in order to actually transform our data is we use the predict function. The first argument is that model that we just created in the last line. And then we have new data. So the new data is, I mean, it's actually a little bit of a misnomer because the new data are the old data. So pass in the training set, store that in this new data, the training set here, and then bam, our data are transformed. We're going to do something very, very similar in this next chunk. That is, we're going to specify a formula to this function called dummy vars because just like I said before, we want a consistent format for our, for our categorical variables, what's known as one-hot encoding. So same sort of thing as before. We create this dummy model object, and then we want to do predict dummy model as the first argument, and then new data, which is really the old data, is a training set. Now, this is going to work a little bit different to how this last chunk did and that what's going to get outputted is a matrix and actually the response variable gets dropped that's why i'm just going to call this training set x because what's basically outputted is a matrix of all of your predictors i wrapped this functionality here inside of the as data frame function just to turn that matrix into a data frame so now i just have a data frame of all of the predictors i have to go back at the end and add that response variable back in but not before i normalize all the predictors so this range uh value that i'm going to pass to the method argument here that's how we normalize what I mean by normalize is we're converting all the values to range between zero and one. Now in a situation where we have all continuous variables, I like to just standardize, but we're going to normalize rather than standardize. Rather, we're going to do a zero to one range instead of a, a z-score range here. So we're gonna go through a very similar sort of procedure here, uh, just like we did up above. And now in this last chunk of code here, I'm going to add that class variable back in. I'm going to make sure the name is appropriate. I'm going to call it class right at the end here. So once again, I'm binding uh, that class variable from the original training set uh, to this training set X thing, which is actually the transformed set of predictors. So response variable, predictors, all together in one data frame, bam, we're good to go. So that's all for today. In part two, we're going to apply the same procedures that we did to the training set to the test set. We're also going to see algorithmically how you can identify features which aren't really adding a whole lot from a predictive standpoint. Then we're going to start training some models. So I'll see you all then. For now, make sure you smash the like button on the video and I'll see you all in the not so distant future. Until then, Richard on data.